and he said ke give me your address i i shall send my book to you and i was just looking at the, that book um, some time back uh, emergence of commercial justice uh, i believe the kind of a uh, uh, practical uh, inputs that we had that he has brought into that book should be very useful for the students of law uh, who need lot of uh, guidance from senior uh, um, senior professionals in the field because without that guidance they i mean it's very difficult to establish oneself in the uh, lawyering field as such friends um, <clears throat> i also take this opportunity to thank my colleagues uh, dr zubair and dr anuradha and the whole team which has uh, uh, contributed tremendously for the organization of this uh, uh, webinar on law and economics as dr anuradha was talking about that conventional is no more the norm these days uh unfortunately subject of law and economics is something which is comparatively uh, new to us um in legal education in fact law and economics has been neglected for a very long time i would say because law and economics as a discipline in uh, uh, american legal system and in in european legal systems as well has been there for around a century but um, this is started uh, you see uh, getting noticed in uh, legal fraternity only around 1980s or 1990s uh, in fact law and economics i read for the first time when i was out of the country i never was exposed to law and economics when i was within my own country so 1980s 1990s i believe is the time when you see these five year law courses also became very popular and we started teaching these subjects to the students um i mean otherwise speaking india also had its tradition of you see law and economics arthashastra by kautilya uh, you see is not a book on economics it is actually on law and uh, uh, political science to be very frank and during medieval is i mean modern uh, ages like in european systems and all that we had some wonderful names like adam smith who would talk about economic effects of mercantile legislation david ricardo talking about lot of uh, british legislation which would uh, uh, leave a lot of impact on uh, variety of economic activities in britain and in uh, american uh, legal system we had justice learned hand and justice richard posner you see who tre uh, contributed tremendously to the growth of this discipline um friends uh, uh, if you look at uh, some of the recent uh, uh, developments in fact uh, um, the the way this behavioral economics is becoming a race these days and uh, number of nobel prizes for economics during last one decade had gone to majority of them seven or eight to behavioral economics which is basically uh, you see a, a sort of a study uh, of um, i uh, see how the uh, human behavior and his uh, economic uh, activity uh, affects the uh, the rule making process M my understanding is that uh, this uh, uh, discipline is right now opening up in india and uh, we in our uh, own small ways have been trying to uh, ensure that you see uh, a proper exposure of this uh, to the students is given in this subject so this uh, legal uh, entrepreneurship cell that we had uh, uh, started uh, last year i believe uh, will go a long way in uh, uh, managing such programs and exposing students to the discipline of law and economics uh, i once again put on record my Uh, thanks to my colleagues who have uh, um, invested a lot of time and energy in uh, conceptualizing and organizing this national webinar on law and economics uh, thank you so much once again to my guests as well uh, over to you dr anuradha thank you so much sir i would now like to enlighten the audience about our first speaker for the day mr vivek sood who is a senior advocate in supreme court of india 
Mr. Sood is uh, amongst the leading senior counsels in India with three decades of experience in diverse areas such as criminal laws, commercial disputes, arbitration, insolvency, information technology, media laws, and constitutional law. He is known for arguing the most complex briefs in the high courts, tribunals, and the Supreme Court. Amongst the innumerable uh, briefs that he has argued, many have received wide media coverage and are cited as precedents. His excellence is manifested through the quality of his arguments in the courts. Apart from being a busy senior counsel, he has authored four books and is amongst the leaders of the Indian bar, who is frequently called upon to speak on legal issues of significance. Mr. Sood coined the concept of the fundamental right to internet in his book released in 2011, and the Supreme Court recognized the expression in 2019 while deciding the Jammu and Kashmir internet shutdown case. Mr. Vivek Sood is a multifaceted personality. Apart from successful law practice, he strongly believes in espousing causes that have a strong social impact, such as appearing in important public interest litigations, as well as assisting the court as amicus curicus. In various matters and promoting DNA evidence in the criminal justice system, partnering with uh, Ojale uh, India and Honeywell USA. With this, I invite sir to kindly address the gathering. Sir. I'm grateful to the University School of Law and Legal Studies, Guru Gobind Singh Indra Press University for inviting me on this platform to be one of the keynote speakers. I'm grateful to Professor Amar Pal Singh Ji and his entire team for giving me this platform and the opportunity to talk about a very contemporary subject, law and economics. I'm reminded of a quote from Kenneth E. Boulding when he said, mathematics brought rigor to economics. Unfortunately, it also brought mortis. So I have found too much of mathematics and statistics in economics. I have never been a student of economics. I am a student of law. I, you know, uh, I'm always a student of law. You may, you may become a senior counsel. You may have three decades of experience or five decades of experience, but one remains a student of law, you know, because law is an ocean by itself. It's a very well chosen topic, law and economics. And, uh, you know, we have, we in India have not actually recognized law as part of the economy, the economic studies. I will endeavor to give my perspective on the connection between law and economics. The connection between law and economics starts from the Constitution of India. And the preamble itself speaks of economic justice. I will read out the relevant part of the preamble of the Constitution. We, the people of India, having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic, and to secure to all its citizens, very important, justice social, economic, and political. So the preamble of the Constitution of India starts by using the expression economic justice. Now, what is economic justice? It cannot be pigeonholed in a definition. It has not been defined in the Constitution. So therefore, it has many facets. Therefore, it is impossible to really define and pigeonhole economic justice in a definition. The content of the term economic justice would vary depending upon the context. Economic justice is a comprehensive constitutional concept 
that keeps evolving with time. Its scope and ambit is expansive in nature, keeping in view the changing society and growing aspirations of the citizen of India. The concept of economic justice is scattered across the constitution of India. In other words, it is embedded in numerous provisions of the constitution. I will, I, will, I will just run through some of those provisions of the constitution which speak of economic justice. In other words, the connectivity between constitutional law and economics. Economic justice is echoed in several fundamental rights in part three of the constitution of India. For instance, the fundamental right to equality has economic justice within its ambit. Article 14 of the Constitution states that the state shall not deny to any person equality before the law or the equal protection of laws. Under this clause, the government can classify persons while making laws, but it must not be arbitrary. The classification must be based on an intelligible differentia having a nexus with the object sought to be achieved by the law. Economic justice forms the largest components of the fundamental right to equality. The government is empowered to make special provisions for the advancement of socially and economically backward classes of citizens, as well as scheduled caste and scheduled tribes. This is yet another facet of economic justice. The fundamental right to equality of opportunity in matters of state employment and equal pay for equal work are dimensions of economic justice too. Article 19.1G of the Constitution provides the fundamental right to practice any profession or to carry on any occupation, trade or business, and that the government can impose reasonable restrictions on the right which are directly connected with economic justice. The fundamental right to life and liberty guaranteed under Article 21 of the Constitution has been expanded to myriad economic activities and just and thus economic justice can be found therein too. Prohibitions against bonded labor, employing children, protection of workmen in hazardous industries are all facets of economic justice. The directive principles of state policy also contain several elements of economic justice. The state must strive to promote the welfare of the people by securing and protecting as effectively as it may a social order in which justice, social, economic, and political shall inform all all the institutions of national life. It must strive to minimize the equalities in income and endeavor to eliminate inequalities in status, facilities, and opportunities. Not only amongst individuals, but also amongst groups of people residing in different areas or engaged in different vocations. The state must also direct its policy towards securing, that is the citizens, Men and women equally have the right to an adequate means of livelihood, that the ownership and control of the material resources of the community are so distributed as best to subserve the common good, that the operation of the economic system does not result in the concentration of wealth and means of production to the common detriment, that there is equal pay for equal work for both men and women and that the health and strength of workers, men and women, and the tender age of children are not abused. And the citizens are not forced by economic necessity to enter avocations unsuited to otherwise unsuited to their age or strength. The state must endeavor to secure to all workers, agricultural, industrial, or otherwise work, a living wage, conditions of work, ensuring a decent standard of life and full of enjoyment of leisure and social and cultural opportunities. The state must also take steps to secure that participation of workers in the management of undertakings, establishments, or other organizations engaged in any industry 
also it must promote the educational and economic interests of the weaker sections of the people. Freedom of trade, commerce, and intercourse throughout the country is also an integral part of economic justice. Similarly, the power of the parliament to make laws imposing such restrictions on the freedom of trade, commerce, or intercourse between one state and another or within any part of the territory of India as may be required in the public interest is a component of economic justice. Emergency provisions of the constitution, especially financial emergency, also are also connected with economic justice. Making laws and economic policies to implement the above fundamental rights, directive principles of of state policy and other constitutional provisions also seek to achieve economic justice. Poverty alleviation programs of the government also constitute economic justice. Hence, the concept of economic justice is broad in ambit and cannot be combined or confined within a definition. It has many diverse elements. Now, with this background of the constitution, let me talk about the connection between legislation and economics, law and economics. I will start with the year 2015. In my view, 2015 is a watershed year in the history of the country. In my view, 2015 is as important or even more important than 1991 economic reforms. I will endeavor to demonstrate this in a while. From 2015 onwards, what happens to the Indian economy? We find a gamut of legislations which have come into existence since 2015. Let me start with RERA, the Real Estate Regulatory Authority Act of 2016. Now, prior to 2016, what was the status of home buyers in the country? Home buyers at large had been defrauded by innumerable real estate companies in India. I'm not trying to say that every real estate company is unethical or dishonest, but innumerable real estate companies, they misappropriated the money, the hard-earned money of home buyers across the country. Home is a dream for every citizen. You know, every, every government servant who retires, every, every corporate employee who is retiring, every professional, every businessman, from top to bottom, every citizen dreams of a home. And therefore, he invests his hard-earned money in buying a dream home. Now, prior to 2016, the dream home remained a dream. People invested their life savings, attractive construction-linked plans, and attractive investment opportunities that were, that were induced upon them by unethical real estate companies. And what was the legal framework available to citizens, to aggrieved home buyers prior to 2016. We had the Consumer Protection Act of 1986. Was it good enough? In my, in my experience of three decades at the bar, Consumer Protection Act of 1986 has been a miserable failure in ameliorating the rights of home buyers. Consumer courts across the country are clogged by cases and your infrastructure is la far lagging behind the number of cases that are flooded in consumer courts. Furthermore, consumer courts do not have teeth. So therefore, I found that home buyers languishing and protesting on the street against the unethical builders across the country. And the builders got away with impunity. Now comes 2016, and we have RERA, the Real Estate Regulatory Authority Act of 2016. RERA, in my view, 
is a revolutionary piece of legislation that takes home buyers out of this street protest and grants realistic and strong legal rights. Now, let me explain some of the salient features of RERA so that we can compare this law from what, where we, what, where, what we, where we were prior to 2016. RERA gives powers to an authority, the RERA authority. And the power is not only of adjudication of grievances. The real estate sector in India after RERA is regulated from the inception of the project to the delivery of the apartment or the home to the adjudication of penalties against errant builders. One of the days when builders would thrust upon the consumers, the home buyers, a contract that was to be signed on dotted line by citizens, you know, by consumers. They never had a legal understanding and they were just made to, you know, give, put their thumb impression or their signatures on these one-sided exploitative contracts that were framed by, uh, you know, these builders and their legal teams. Not anymore. Now, the RERA authority will vet those contracts. The Supreme Court the other day in one of the matters has said that they should be model contracts between home buyers and consumers. This is a facet of economic justice. Here is the connectivity between law and economic activity, law and economics. From RERA, I move on to the Commercial Courts Act of 2015. I have been practicing at the bar for the last three decades. When I started out in 1992 onwards till 2015, I have seen litigations get delayed up to half a century also. 10 years was normal, 10 years was short, 20 years was quite okay. I have seen litigations span over three decades, four decades, and even five decades. Now comes the Commercial Courts Act of 2015. Commercial disputes have been segregated. They have been broadly defined. So myriad disputes have been classified as commercial disputes under the Commercial Courts Act of 2015. What took 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, and 50 years in the court today takes six months, one year, one and a half years, two years, three years in the court. Again, you know, the entire, the entire legal procedure that was provided in the colonial legislation called the Code of Civil Procedure, 1908, has been shrunk. And today, today the commercial community, especially the investor community, community from, uh, from uh, you know, outside India, they can have confidence in the commercial justice system. We never had a commercial justice system in India. You know, when I was studying, when I was a student of law, and when I came into the uh, profession, we had only two systems, the civil justice and the criminal justice. In my submission, in my argument, the commercial justice has emerged in India with the Commercial Courts Act of 2015. Procedure for adjudication of a commercial dispute has been shrunk. And it is not only for new disputes, even pending disputes have been classified as commercial dispute. The Commercial Courts Act includes the district judiciary, the high court, the appellate courts, the entire legal system benefits from the Commercial Courts Act of 2015. I come to the next legislation, another facet of economic justice in India. The Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code of 2016. It's a revolutionary piece of legislation. Prior to 2016, prior to IBC, what was the corporate uh, scenario? Our Indian economy was a debtor's hell, de sorry, a debtor's paradise and a creditor's hell. Justice Rohingya Narivan in Swiss ribbons has said that prior to the IBC 2016, the Indian economy 
was a debtor's paradise. Companies would take loans from banks and financial institutions. They would default with impunity. And you had a law called SICA, the Sikh Industrial Companies Act of 1985, a miserable piece of legislation that failed in every quarter. It took years and years to determine sickness. And the Board of Industrial and Financial Reconstruction did not have teeth. And the promoters of these companies, these unethical promoters, they never wanted sickness to be resolved because they were in the driver's seat. They, they were the income. During the process, when the corporate debtor was being was before the BIFR and the AAIFR. Judicial delays took their own toll. It took years and years and decades for sickness to be resolved. And ultimately, by the time the court would decide that a particular resolution plan was justified or reasonable, it had become obsolete by then. So Sika miserably failed to help the Indian economy. Now comes the IBC of 2016. If a corporate debtor defaults in the sum of rupees one crore or more, the financial creditor or the operational creditor can move the NCLT, the National Company Law Tribunal. Within weeks, the resolution professional is appointed and put in the driver's seat to run the corporate debtor. The incumbent management is shown the door within weeks or months of the petition being admitted by the National Company Law Tribunal. Therefore, you, you may have promoted the company, you may have run the company for hundreds of hundreds of years, or 50 years or 60 years. Companies were run like sole proprietorships, ownerships prior to 2016. Today, after a month or two, the incumbent management is shown the door. And what happens? The corporate debtor is advertised in the commercial world. People apply with their resolution plans. The resolution plans are placed before the committee of creditors. And by a democratic voting, within a certain time frame, the particular resolution plan that is accepted is approved by the NCLT. And a new management is into the driver's seat. Unimaginable things have happened since the IPC came into play. Could you ever imagine that SR, the great SR, would actually change hands? Could anybody imagine that Bhushan Steel would be out, the Bhushans will be out, and Bhushan Steel will go to the Tatas? So IBC, IBC is, is a facet of economic justice. Justice Rohington Nariman in Swiss Reserve Ribbons goes on to say that after the IBC, fairness, equity, and justice have been restored into the Indian economy. This is the power of the IBC of 2016. Here is another legislation which speaks of connectivity between law and economics. I move on to the next legislation, the Fugitive Offenders Act of 2018. You know, we have all heard of the Nirav Modi's and et cetera, et cetera, fleeing the country. Now that's only tip of the iceberg. There are so many, so many fugitives who have left the country, you know, where the, where the debt involved is 10 crores, 20 crores, 30 crores, 50 crores, 100 crores. We can only see the big fish. But now comes the Fugitive Offenders Act of 2018. So you run away, you run away. You can run away one evening or one morning. You can take a flight to Nepal or this, that, and deviously flee the country. But what happens? Your property out here is liable to be attached, confiscated, till you come and face the criminal investigation and face the trial. Fugitive Offenders Act of 2018 is another facet of economic justice in India that has been ushered into the Indian economy. I come to another piece of legislation, the Arbitration Act of 2016, the amendments of the Arbitration Act of 2016. The dispute resolution mechanism, the alternative dispute resolution mechanism 
through arbitration of 90 through the arbitration act of 1996 were facing was facing gross problems for example delay you know the the purpose of arbitration is expeditious resolution of a commercial dispute of a dispute by an alternative tribunal called the arbitral tribunal now the arbitral award would be passed in a year or two or three years but ultimately it would be challenged in the court of law under section 34 of the arbitration act and what happened in the court it took years and decades for the petition under section 34 to be decided and the law of 1996 said the moment you challenged an award in the court of law there was an automatic stay which means the winner of the arbitration did not enjoy the fruits of the award till the high court or the appellate court till the court decided upon the section 34 petition which took years and years and decades that led to a complete failure of the mechanism of arbitration now you have in 2016 you have the amendment act in the uh, the arbitration amendment act first of all apart from the numerous amendments i will talk about the salient features of the amendments carried out in the arbitration act first of all the concept of automatic stay has been done away with the moment there is an award the aggrieved party may challenge the award under section 34 but you have to pay or deposit the fruits of the award in the court which means the the winning litigant gets the fruits of the award as soon as possible unless the appellate courts finds that the award is perverse prima facie and stays the operation of the award secondly the grounds of challenge under section 34 had become very broad it had become like an appeal so it was being said by jurists what is good of an arbitration if you have an appeal mechanism and it become like a civil appeal in the court the very purpose of arbitration is lost now the grounds of challenge under section 34 have been narrowed considerably narrowed another piece of legislation that is significant the prevention of corruption act 1986 now we all know of the policy paralysis that happened in india prior to 2014 2015 the bureaucrats were not willing to take decisions because of you know some draconian provisions in the prevention of corruption act of 1986 the bureaucrats you know because the, the, the there was a provision that if any decision is found to be contrary to public interest it amounts to a corrupt practice and the public servant is liable to be prosecuted it was a broad provision grossly abused provision grossly misused provision it was amenable to misinterpretation and a number of innocent public servants would be prosecuted now the law has been amended i think in 2018 or 2019 and the definition of corruption by public servants has been narrowed so the generality the vagueness that was there in the definition earlier has been taken out and the provision has been made very very specific therefore the bureaucracy today has the freedom to take bold decisions in public interest another important aspect of economic justice in my view i am an apolitical i am a non political man i am a lawyer so i am not you know i am not i don't have political leanings but integration of jnk with the indian economy you know by with the abrogation of article 370 is another facet of economic justice for the citizens of jnk and for the citizens of india i am not going into the political aspects of this part i come to the last part of my my discussion at the center of economic justice is the common man is the welfare of the citizens of india welfare of we the people of india from top to bottom 
the Indian economy is not only for large corporate enterprises. It is for everybody. Every citizen must get his due from the Indian economy. And that is my definition of economic justice. Now, let's see from 2015 onwards, some of these schemes of the government of India speak of economic justice being ushered into the Indian economy in the life of the common man. For example, the Jan Dhan account. Now, in my, in my view, it, it, it looks small, but it has far-reaching implications for the common man. When a rickshaw puller or a small tea vendor, when he goes and opens a bank account, it opens the doors of innumerable financial products before him. He can buy an insurance policy. He can get a mediclaim. He can, uh, he can invest in mutual funds. So a host of financial services are at his command once he opens a bank account. Homes for all, you know, the homes for all is again a revolutionary step where the government has promised concrete pakka homes with toilets, 24 seven electricity for all. It's a good move in the right direction. The Pradhan Mantri Awas Yojana, Yojana. The National Skill Development Mission is another good, good step in the right direction where the unregulated sector, the unorganized sector workers can develop their skills and earn their livelihood and grow like, the, like us, you know, rather than lagging behind in the Indian economy. You know, for me, GDP numbers and inflation is secondary. So I started by saying there is too much of statistics in the Indian economy, the way we judge our Indian economy. Therefore, I welcome this program, Law and Economics. You know, that it's, it's a very interesting topic that has been chosen uh, by the organizers of this program. Thank you, sir. Uh, now, now, thank now you. therefore, I will just I will just conclude. I know I have I have taken my 30, 35 minutes. So eventually, in my in my view, say uh, 2015 is a watershed year in the Indian economy. Law has a deep connection with economics, with the Indian economy. And you know, I wish that uh, you know, Mr. Professor Amar Pal Singh Ji, he said that this. This connectivity between law and economics has been missing in India. And we are obsessed with statistics and mathematics in economics. That's why, you know, I, I fear reading these statistics and economics. I run away from the economic times uh, every morning. So, uh, so therefore, it's a, it's a very good step. It's a big step in the right, right direction. And I congratulate all of you, you know, for organizing this program. I, I hope we can do more of these programs. Now, all said and done. We are, it's all a work in process. I'm not saying that we have attained nirvana. There's nothing called a nirvana. So these are, you know, these economic legislations, they are all works in process. And I wish, I wish, you know, we can see more and more prosperity in, in the times to come for our country. And today, today I find, you know, there are opportunities for all in the Indian economy. Look at the concept of startups. Look at unicorns. You know, most of these startups are by youngsters coming from middle class families. You know, you don't have these big families running these startups. So there is democratization of the Indian economy. So with this, I end my note and I'm grateful to you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for sharing your expert comments. And since uh, Anil sir is <laughs> getting late, I'm sorry for that. Uh, so I now introduce our uh, second guest of the day, uh, Mr. Arun Anil uh, Turanganath, who being a member of the uh, Indian Foreign Service has served in the Indian missions in Bangladesh, Mongolia, USA, Russia, Sweden, Nigeria, Libya, Jordan. During his association with Ministry of External Affairs, he has worked in the Economic West Asia and North Africa and Consular Divisions. He also served as Director General, Joint Secretary for the Gulf and Hajj Divisions in the Ministry of External Affairs, New Delhi. He has also acted as Deputy Chief of Mission in the rank of Ambassador in the Embassy of India, Moscow, prior to his superannuation in May 2016. He served as Ambassador of India to Jordan and Libya and High Commissioner to Malta. 
He had made significant contributions in research on World Trade Organization and regional trading blocks at the Oxford University. He's a member of the All India Management Association, Delhi Management Association, as well as that of Oxford and Cambridge Society of India and the Association of Indian Diplomats, that is the former ambassadors. He is also the honorary member of the International Trade Council's <clears throat> presidents. He is a distinguished fellow and head of West Asia Experts Group at the Vivekananda International Foundation, as member of Governing Council, Raisina House, Indian Forum for Public Diplomacy. He is also a visiting fellow and advisor to the Asian Institute of Diplomacy and International Affairs and Nepal Institute of International Cooperation and Management. Presently, he is the president of MICA, that is the Chamber of Commerce, Industry and uh, Agriculture. He has recently joined the International Advisory Council for Confederation of Indian Industries. He is also on the board of BRICS Chamber of Commerce and Asia Africa Chamber of Commerce. He is also an advisor to the GD Goenka University School of Management as well as a Gandhian an NGO, Shanti Sahyog Center for Nonviolence. I request you, sir, to kindly address our audience on the occasion of this webinar. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for that kind and elaborate introduction. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, esteemed Dean Professor Singh, Professor Anuradha Jha, and the esteemed faculty. Uh, the distinguished keynote speaker, Mr. Vivek Sood, and my young friends. Thank you for this kind invitation to include me in your deliberations at this national webinar on law and economics. A subject well studied and is still evolving as the nature of economics and economic engagement changes. Digital was not even thought of and pandemic has further expedited it. A Zomato and a Swiggy and the e-commerce and giants like Amazon were not even conceived just a decades ago. So when we look at it, we have to look at the law of economics or the economics of law. Data was never appeared to be the new gold, but it is. So you need to develop new laws and frameworks to transact in a fair and transparent manner so that the gold rush for data could be avoided. Not all countries are well endowed with legal acumen like India, and that is very transparent and evident in the negotiating skills and clarity we just saw with Mr. Sood's brilliant presentation, which we have also displayed in multilateral fora. Also, the politics of economics is as important, and therefore, Arth Shastra did provide guiding principles for us millennia ago, as Professor Singh mentioned. In fact, today, the diplomacy, especially the economic diplomacy, is conducted at the highest level. You may have remembered then when we had some uh, situation with regard to the duties on the American motorcycles, Harley Davidson, President Trump virtually threatened India. And when we reduced it from 50% to 25%, he said it's peanuts. So you can imagine the way the economic engagement with the, in the international discourse is conducted. And therefore, as you know that I am neither an economist nor a lawyer, but as they say, the diplomats are generalists, so might as well know a bit about everything. Since the impact of law is taken recourse in conducting treaty obligations, negotiations, and redressal mechanisms, when for reaching conclusions or defending our instance, we need tremendous legal input at every stage of the way. In the Ministry of External Affairs, we have a legal and treaties division whose analysis and assessments are critical and crucial for every treaty or the memorandum of understanding or a statement in this regard 
that we issue depending on the law of the land as well as the international law so you can imagine even though it is less talked about in public discourse on diplomacy it is a very critical area for us hence i guess that is one reason that i have been asked to speak on this topic i can't claim to know much as the laws various legislations have been very very elaborately uh, explained to you and you study it yourself on a daily basis but perhaps my research at the oxford university on wto and regional trading blocks was the nearest i reached in this domain and economic diplomacy for some reason also has been my major forte and area of interest during my most of my career so i have seen it in a practical dimension and thus precisely what i would like to talk and later on a little bit touch upon the biggest international global order that is manifested by world trade organization and the problem to the liberal trading world order which all the theorists mentioned by professor singh have very ably worked out but most of them did not even think about the unilateralism and the protectionism in the trading methodologies that were eventually developed imposed restraining the other ex exporters and other other uh, players in the field as far as india is concerned i think the economic diplomacy became the major tool and necessity when india embarked on these wide ranging economic reforms and we continue to reform our economy it started some 30 odd years ago in 1991 which basically aimed at the troika of privatization liberalization and globalization and attracting the foreign investments and subsequently the technology became the primary objectives i can tell you from my experience i was very fortunate to be in new york at the time as trade commissioner and i saw how at that time dr manmohan singh was the finance minister and the team was so engaged in explaining everything and i went to harvard university once to meet professor jeffrey sachs and i was trying to explain to him about what the indian economy how it is evolving what is happening and his prescription to me was you are just not doing enough you must open everything otherwise india will not make it that was his decision in 1994 and where india is today we all know i had come from mongolia at the time which was basically a socialist economy where all the means of production were in the state control so with control at the time it became independent became a sort of democracy and the americans went there as the third neighbor of theirs saying that china and russia are your neighbors but we are the your third neighbor and the third neighbor the same professor jeffrey sachs brilliant economist who had also sent his team to mongolia to help them and i had that famous an unfortunate instance and i mentioned to him that you have succeeded in poland but failed miserably in mongolia a small country with small foreign exchange the model has not worked so we are on a learning curve we are not going very fast and as has been mentioned before india continues to evolve various laws addressing archaic laws and that is what you must be studying about this well in the international trade and investment the application of law is always implicit from analysis from legal points of view to arbitration to dispute resolution and then the courts of law including in the wto we all negotiate double taxation avoidance agreements we negotiate international and bilateral treaties like the bilateral investment protection agreement and it was mentioned about the insolvency by mr sue in india it is supposed to be uh, an amazing uh, act of law but i remember during my time in new york 
the Americans are famous for chapter 11 of insolvency, whereby any company can file for insolvency. Now that chapter 11 at that time, I remember, had created such a big mischief for our company because you just can't claim anything. The traders, the investors, you are the last one. And some of the Indians who had their companies there declared insolvency under chapter 11 and the Indian banks lost over millions of dollars. So you have no recourse to that kind of a thing. So there is another thing. More importantly, when a situation involves the SMEs, they really cannot take recourse to the uh, various legal provisions that are available. It is very expensive to do the arbitration and to go into the legal recourse when the, the, the terrain like the US and others are concerned as far as international trade is concerned. You know that India has always been a trading nation. And therefore, our contribution to global trade today is simply around 2%. It has gone down tremendously. We need to increase that. And that is something that is requires the value and supply chains to come along. We are also a very big market, which has its own challenges. When we talk about doing business with India index, that means your laws are much better, much more welcoming. And as we see Prime Minister also mentioning that from uh, uh, red, uh, red carpet welcome, from the bureaucratic red tape is what India is trying to do, perform, reform, and all those kind of things. That definitely they're happening. That has improved India's ranking. But when I say that the DBI is 53, 63, whatever be there, we've improved, we cannot forget that there are 53 countries above you or 52 countries above you still. And the foreign investment is looking for markets where doing business is far more easier. During the pandemic, we have seen how China operated. Every whole world wanted the companies to move out of China. Those who did move because of political reasons, because of other reasons, they did look for one plus one model, keeping their foot in China and then finding another alternative. Most of them did not come to India. Most of them went to ASEAN countries. Now that shows you that the laws that we have in the country needs to be competitive enough to be able to attract like if as was mentioned by mr sood that if you go for litigation forget about from decades that you might even get in, uh, something out of it you go in for arbitration which, which which is not cannot be implemented just like that unless it is finally endorsed by the law so therefore you have these kind of problems and we have seen what happened to the vodafone and others where the retroactive laws were implemented and eventually we lost in that so that is the purpose of that what i'm trying to say the laws that exist in our country and they impinge on the foreign investment not only bother or create a problem with that particular company or that particular incident but they have a far-reaching impact for our future uh, usp that when we go out and tell, this is the job of the ambassadors and others, to tell the world, okay, we are open, please come and uh, in, invest in India. Now that's where you have a very major problem. Now, laws are always there. I mean, you know that we, we are just talking about the Russia-Ukraine conflict today, which has tremendous implications for the world. And this fallout as a result of the unilateral sanctions that have been imposed as a tool from out of their two American toolbox, are going to have a major impact on all the countries. So they have imposed sanctions on Russia, but then they have something called Katsa, which all of you must have heard in the context of S-400 imports from Russia. We had sanctions on Iran. They were unilateral sanctions. And Iranians, we were forced to eventually reduce our imports from 100% to 0%. 11% it accounted for from Iran because of those sanctions. Otherwise, your companies will come in the fire line, line of fire, and then you'll not be able to do business. So what is the role of the unilateral sanctions? What is the legal recourse available to us in these kind of situations? For the time being, Ukraine 
has gone to uh, the International Court of Justice. It has also asked the WTO to drop the multi uh, most favored nations uh, uh, the treatment that it has to give to Russia during this conflict period, and also application of various other regulations that the WTO puts out. That is the sole uh, international body that we have at the moment, uh, which has some kind of flaws. But as most of you must be hearing, is that this unilateral madness, do we have any kind of a law that can be invoked? Can you go to the court of law? Nothing much can happen because even today we have a jungle raj that is prevailing very much in the real, uh, real market situation in the real world, basically. So as far as India is concerned, I know that we are looking at being a law and uh, abiding society. We are trying to also reach out to the world in a very different manner. And that is something called Vasudev Kutumkam, as you must be hearing it. It is that we don't have our own great value and global value in supply chains. When we are talking about being a pharmacy of the world, or we talk about as the vaccine hub of the world, we are dependent a great extent, 80% on the APIs from China, the country with which we are at war. And therefore, the disruption in the supply chains, the disruption in the semiconductors, those are the things that are impacting the whole world in that sense. So therefore, there is a need for us to really work on these kind of global value supply chains that can provide you an alternative mode and some kind of a stakeholding by the world uh, in that sense. So I am I'm thinking then another thing in the in this context, what we did was, you know, intellectual property rights. And many of you are going to be the intellectual property right lawyers. Now that is another very major area of discord between the developing world and the developed world. There are certain procedures, whether you follow the process or you follow the product patenting, and that is being discussed everywhere. And that causes a major problem. I remember when I was in Moscow, we were the set, probably the largest pharmaceutical product suppliers to that country. But the, all these American companies like Pfizer and all launched heavy uh, legal penalties and cases against India legal suits uh, against the Indian companies uh, like uh, the, uh, at that time Renbexi was there uh, and Redis and others. We won the case. But at the same time, this puts you on the back foot quite a bit. World Trade Organization, as you know, I'm not going to go into the history of it, but you all know about it. It has started with general, general agreements on trade and tariffs, because trade and tariffs, both these things are extremely intricate and uh, involve one another. The global community after the Second World War started to have uh, some kind of mechanisms that are going to work. Marrakesh Agreement was signed but it was not complete. Eventually, how do they fight one another when there is a problem between one country and the other country on certain issues, whether it is relating to dumping, whether it is relating to countervailing duties, whether it, it, retailing, uh, it, it pertains to uh, the uh, non-tariff barriers. Now, non-tariff barriers, when we talk about, you can see the ESG mechanism, that is environmental, security, labor, and all those kind of standards that come into play and governance also. So you can just get up and say, no, you are not following these, therefore you don't have the market access. Now, therefore it was decided that we should have a dispute uh, mechanism, which could at least help any country going there. But its rules and regulations are so complicated and they are all really very uh, properly drafted and crafted, but then we see that there is always uh, an issue for large number of countries to go in and contest that. India is well endowed, so it can do that. But many of the countries can't do this uh, in, in my view. So we see that this international economic law basically is becoming increasingly important uh, and uh, needs to be really worked upon uh, by all concerned in a very big way. We need to see the loopholes that are there. Can we change the law? That is again a legislation principle. 
could it be made far more uh, important because you have all kinds of laws in the international field that economic law which is uh, regulation and conduct of states uh, international organizations private firms public firms uh, which are all operating in the international economic area so we are going to have that kind of a, a continuous problem uh, relating to various dimensions of the law and the legal practices and although there are several range of uh, disciplines that we study today each of them tend to have an impact uh, on us now it is a far reaching uh, area in which because we cannot live without trading one with one another without investing without having comparative advantage being leveraged uh, in every country so do we have some kind of a, an international uh, proper uh, infrastructure and the structure uh, that can allow a fairness like uh, mr sood was talking about economic justice now the justice uh, is also a relative word in this sense of the term uh, because if uh, justice delayed is justice denied as they say same thing happens in the courts of the international uh, uh, courts as well as in the world trade organization even so even though international trade is an engine of economic growth i believe that we would need to to, to work together uh, with the major companies and major countries you'll be surprised that we have something called um, uh, devos every year every you all must have heard about this uh, the devos summit that happens where everybody comes who who of the world comes there but what are they they discussing in that place how to exploit the market how to flag the opportunities but no one discusses how to create some kind of uniform and implementable standards which are uh, which are basically in consonance with justice with law with equal opportunity that's not there so i think that there this for our young friends who are there for them it is important to think a little bit out of the box and try to see whether we are we can india can india should uh contribute in this regard we continue to do so we have done so many times in the at the international stage in the 75 years of our existence and i guess we need to do that i have purposely not talked about wto even though it was my research subject it requires a lot of reforms and lastly i would like to just tell you that the americans and the europeans they have their regional trading blocks with which they eke out their advantage so when you are negotiating a free trade agreement with european union or with the usa these are legal negotiations every inch of the way you will find that you will come across some legal hurdle or the other and they are the bureaucracies of a very different level or a different kind they want everything but they don't want to give anything so that is where the legal challenge in the economic domain for our budding lawyers going to be and we'll see how it plays out eventually um you mentioned very good that very well that you have incubators so i hope that the uh, the innovation that you spoke about will become the innovation of a different level and different kind i once again i would like to thank you very much for inviting me i'm sorry i wish i could spend more time but i have something very important which i could not avoid out of this but once again i'll be very happy to again connect with you thank you so much thank you so much sir for this wonderful talk it was really very enriching i now request uh, dr zubaid sir to offer a vote of thanks to our dignitaries uh thank you uh, dr anwar jha madam uh a very good morning to all the respected uh, friends colleagues and the participants uh, as rightly discussed uh, by our keynote speakers that uh, no there is no doubt that uh, economics is one of the very advanced uh, subject in the social science uh, altogether but uh, law is usually used viewed as a social tool to that promotes the uh, economic efficiency in general and uh, nowadays the the time has changed altogether where we have seen that these two uh, subjects have developed their own social construct 
and uh, every day now we have hearing that uh, now the the issue of behavioral economics has been discussed at even at every legal platform also so with this perspective altogether where we need to develop more research on this particular issue our keynote speakers have discussed about number of issues also i like to give my sincere gratitude to the senior educate vivek sooth sir also who uh, spoke uh, so uh, very uh, emphatically on the multifaceted issues of economic justice in general and uh, i really appreciate how he uh, plays a, plays a very significant role today in the inaugural, inaugural webinar where he discuss about that how so far the we need to understand the the very concept of economic justice to what extent it plays a significant role that in the advancement uh, for the uh, vulnerable sections of our society also and he discuss about plethora of legislations and its impact and how they may play a very significant role for a law researcher or for a law students like us so i'm sure our students of legal entrepreneurship and incubation cell and in general our law students will definitely work upon these issues over the period of time also i'm equally uh, give like to give my sincere gratitude to the uh, the anil sir also who uh, have discussed about the holistic perspective of economic uh, diplomacy how the foreign uh, the investment seems to be very important and the kind of examples he have cited uh, to all of us actually explored us that where we need to do more research on the international investment law in general altogether thank you so much uh, sir also i uh, i like to give my immense thanks to our professor uh, director mahesh verma sir our noble vice chancellor our registrar sir and uh, our dean professor amarpal sir uh, who is the source of inspiration to all of us and also my uh, faculty colleague uh, uh, dr radha jha who is also a faculty coordinator of the legal entrepreneurship and incubation cell also and uh, we are very fortunate enough to have been backed by a very sincere team uh, including uh, student coordinators uh, like ankit uh, hemant prajwal uh, and uh, the p2 phd scholars anmol and asma and many more uh, students who are be part of this uh, as a volunteer team so thank you so much to all of you being a part of this inaugural session uh now i request all of you to be keep said also uh, our keynote speaker may leave and now uh, we will have a two parallel uh, technical sessions so we will share the uh, the zoom link of the second technical sessions within uh, for, uh, within two minutes also thank you so much thank you so much sir to be part of it thank you thank you